Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jess Roman, and I work at the Center for Stroke Research Berlin at the Charité, as well as the Institute of Public Health. And together with Toivo Glatz, Tobias Kurt, and also on behalf of Chisato Ito and Hannah Grillmeyer, I don't want to forget anyone, um, we are organizing this monthly Berlin uh, colloquium series for what we say epidemiological enthusiasts. We're very, very excited to have participants now from all over the world, um, which is now possible in times of Zoom webinars. So welcome if you're joining us for the first time. Just to give you a brief idea of the structure, we um, are typically having about 45 minute to a 55 minute talk followed by some, some nice discussion. We are recording, as you probably noticed, the webinar today. So um, please note that um, we will not be recording the Q&A at the end. So you may feel more free to ask the questions knowing that we're not doing that. That being said, if you want to access the talk later, it will be available on our website. We're doing this the first Wednesday of the month, every month at 4 PM. We also have a journal club on the third Wednesday of the month. And I think that's everything. So without further ado, um, oh, I know, uh, Q&A. So if you have any questions that arise during the talk, you can write them by clicking on that Q&A button. Um, and feel free to also write us in the chat if you have any trouble hearing or any te technical difficulties along the way, and we'll try to address those. After the session today, we'll have a networking session using the platform wonder.me, which is a lot of fun. So if you're looking to connect with some people in the methods community, please join us over on Wonder. I'll be sure to share a link at the end after the Q&A. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speaker today. Uh, I've known him from, for quite some time, and he's well known um, in the Berlin public health and epi community, Stefan Konogorski who's now working at the Hasso Plattner Institute, uh, just a hop, skip and a jump away in Potsdam. So welcome, uh, Stefan. And Stefan will be talking to us today about digital N of one trials, uh, this, this idea of personalized medicine and the connection with population level studies. So I'm very eager to hear about the talk. And uh, Stefan does a lot of teaching activities. I'll also let him speak a bit about his background. Maybe you could mention, Stefan, how you got to where you are today and what your connection to epidemiology is. Without further ado, Stefan. Yeah, so thank you, Jess, for uh, the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. I'm really excited to uh, talk to you about uh, these NF1 trials. And uh, of course, I had to bring personalized medicine into the title uh, to make sure to talk about that with you epidemiologists. So I'm really, really looking forward to uh, talking about that. Um, my background, uh, since you asked Jess, so, and that's all might be interesting where I'm coming from uh, to this topic. So I'm a trained statistician, biostatistician, mathematician, then did my PhD in molecular epi. So really a quantitative uh, population level uh, scientist and uh, started uh, in the group of digital health and machine learning at the Hasso Plattner Institute uh, now at the beginning of 2019. And since then, I uh, have been working a lot more on digital apps, on digital studies in general, and more on these NF1 trials. So with that background also, that's sort of the perspective that I'm taking. Um, but I'm very interested in looking at how can you combine those two. So what can you do with those digital tools and how can you integrate them into studies? And then at the very end of today, um, then I'm hoping to talk and discuss with all of you about how can we combine those, these uh, personalized NF1 trials and population level insights and studies. Um, so Jess already mentioned the Q&A button. I'm really happy to um, stop in between and take questions also in between. I might not be able to see them. So then uh, Jess or Mark or anyone do interrupt me um, and jump in. Uh, so that's maybe the, the most interactive we can get uh, in these Zoom webinars. Yeah, Sounds so good. with that, um, let's get started. So at first I wanted to give a little bit of background and maybe what motivation for these NF1 trials. 
then spend some time um, of actually talking about what they are, about their design aspects, since at least I was not taught in the epi classes or biostats classes that I had uh, what they are, actually. So talk a little bit about them, why they might be special, and then lead over to a platform that we've been developing at the HPI, the, what we call the CDU platform, that allows to implement those NF1 trials. And then at the end, talk a little bit about statistical methods and uh, approaches. However, uh, the talk will be mainly more conceptual and not technical, what I've prepared here. So with that, if we take a step back, or at least how I would conceptualize what I had been working on in the past for lots of times um, about population level research studies, and let's uh, focus on medical research studies for now, then I would say usually you start off with a research question that is connected to a study where you want to investigate the research question. The question generally is asked and the study is designed by a researcher or by a clinician that um, maybe is added uh, and helped by a developer if the study is uh, done digitally. Well, let me quickly check the chat. All right. All good. I'll warn you if there's anything. All right, good, thanks. So the study uh, is mainly conceptualized by researchers. And then having implemented the study, data is gathered from the study participants that I hear um, depicted as dots. Since usually, especially when we're doing these large scale studies, we're not interested. And oftentimes, actually, we want to anonymize the participants. So to us, there might, there might be data points that contribute the data that we then can analyze and get insights about the research questions that we wanted to ask. So with that, in these population level studies, generally we're interested in average effects. So what's the average effect of that treatment, maybe on the disease outcome? If we're talking about cohort epidemiological studies, I think many of the same things we can generalize, we might be interested in the effect of risk factors or some, on some outcome. Coming back to medical studies, then we can derive guidelines, for example, which treatments work best on average in the population. Continuing on to that with a focus on medical research questions. However, now if you take those population level insights and try to bring them down onto patients, then obviously, and I think this is well known, that for many of the drugs, many of the treatments, they are not effective in everyone. And actually then there are studies, this one here that I'm citing is a bit older, but also more recent numbers support this, that there are many treatments also in the, in the big uh, disease areas where the treatments are only effective in about 50%. That might be 40%, that might be 70% for some treatments, but still there's a large treatment heterogeneity. So that for a given person, actually, you don't know whether the treatment's gonna work or not. So in that sense, there's this uh, definitely, I would say, a disconnect if you're going from the population level studies where you're trying to figure out what works best on average, so what should be the best solution if you don't know more about the specific patient, and then actually treating the patient or being a patient yourself and trying to answer the question, what's going to help me the best way. And I think also this we can transfer directly to epidemiological cohort studies, where that might be even more the case when we have risk factors how much uh, do they tell me what really, how the absolute risk is for a given participant in a study or a given citizen. In contrast to that, um, if we focus on the individual, on the person, or if we talk about personalized medicine, the question then is what, how can we figure out and what really helps a given person? So there are some approaches of trying to estimate individual level effects from cohort studies, from RCTs, which I would leave for now by just saying that it's hard. Um, and there are many things to consider if you really try to gather and estimate and test individual level effects using some statistical, some machine learning techniques um, to get to those. Another way what you can do is you can try and stratify further. You can stratify by sex, by gender, by age groups, narrow it down more and more and more. You might try and fine tune that also by stratifying by genetic variants, for example, that might get you closer to what I would say is truly personalized, but can only ever be an approximation in my opinion. 
So while there are obviously some success stories in oncology or then uh, in other very specific areas for genetics that you really can identify some mutation that allows you to de derive the optimal treatment for one person with that given mutation, in my opinion, that's not available and not possible in general to stratify and thereby derive personalized treatment regimes. So then what I would say the gold standard study design for actually deriving and evaluating treatment effects on an individual level are NFON trials. That also have another advantage that if you do these studies in single participants, you can also report back the results to the participant, what actually works best for him or her. So with that, let's talk about N of one trials. Conceptually, you can describe them as multi crossover, randomized or not controlled trials within a single participant. Other names in the literature that are sometimes used are single patient trials or also single case experimental design. That's more from the quantitative self or quantified self uh, domain. And if you look at one example here, if the research question you want to answer is what's the effect of exercise versus painkillers on back pain, then you can design an NF1 trial by saying, well, I'm taking a baseline period or not. But then mainly I'm comparing here these two treatments, exercise versus painkillers in one individual over time. So you would build up the trial and here, what would be depicted is that you have a baseline period. So you have three measurements where you don't provide any treatment and assess your back pain levels. Then you have three time points where you look at exercise. So you look at pain levels after exercise, then one more cycle, one more block where you take painkillers and then assess back pain and so on. And then after assessing those back pain levels, you can do your statistical analysis. And for that participant here, figure out that maybe if I'm looking at those points here, uh, maybe there's no difference between exercise and painkillers on the outcome on back pain. So that would be one N of one trial where you evaluate the treatment effect of exercise versus painkillers on back pain. And you can really tell what's working for this patient and what's working for that patient. And that might be different. For one person here, there might be no different difference. For others, there might be a difference in one way or the other. So if you elaborate on that, so as we've just seen, we can derive individual level effects from these N of one trials. And this is, uh, I would say, how they've been mainly developed. And this is also what their name says, N of one trials. You're performing a trial in a single person. If you're performing multiple N of one trials that are also called series of N of one trials, the same trial, but in different persons, then you can also aggregate those aggregate those in order to derive then population level effects. So if you have a group of 50 participants, all of them perform this one trial on back pain, then in addition to figuring out what helps better for each single one of them, you can derive aggregate effects and then generalize into the populations as well. Now, what are the main applications that I see or also some barriers in the application of NF1 trials? Definitely, I would say they are of interest when there is a heterogeneous intervention effect. So if there's some variability in the treatment effects. If everybody profits from painkillers, then obviously you don't need to figure out what works for a single patient uh, because, everything, because it will work for everyone. But if there is some difference, and I would say there are oftentimes large differences between individuals, then they might be of interest. In other areas, uh, if you're comparing them to the traditional, conventional, randomized control trials, whenever those are not applicable. So that might be for all those people that are excluded from trials, maybe due to comorbid conditions, maybe because they are taking some concurrent treatment, maybe also for rare diseases. So for all of those where you might have no data from large RCTs, that might be another area where they have been popularly applied in the past. The of one trials. If we talk more about that, um, if patients are ongoing and you're trying to figure out which continuation of treatment is better, then this can be one application. 
And in general, for all of those, I would say also really NF1 trials are of interest when you can afford to try things out. So I'm sure uh, that there are many situations where you might not want to perform an NF1 trial, even though you don't know which of the treatment works better. And I would imagine if, if the president comes in and wants to be treated for COVID-19, then you might not say, well, let's compare this uh, antibody cocktail to that um, because we don't know what's going to work, but you're trying your best um, and just taking your bet. The best. So that's definitely one thing to consider. Also, things that are often depicted at least as challenges for NF1 trials are carryover effects and wash in and wash out times. So carryover effects, if you're comparing two treatments within one person and then one treatment, the effect of one treatment still holds and continues to affect while this, the other block is brought in, then you have to consider that at least, or it makes things a lot harder at the very least. Stefan, just one yeah. quick question, if I may, at this point yes. um, came through. Yeah. So in a sense, isn't that what clinicians routinely do to some extent in a much less systematic way? I'm thinking specifically about the pharmacologic treatment of psychiatric disorders where it's common to try out a number of drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that in. So that's all also how I often phrase it. In a way, it's like a systematic trying out um, supported by statistical evidence, I would say. Yes, I agree. And that might give you then, I mean, more scientific evidence um, if it works or what you observe as a clinician also really helps you beyond statistical doubt um, and allows you also to formalize how you would set up such a comparison that you're totally right, you might do as a clinician intuitively. Definitely, yes. And I think I'm going to come back to that later also, that uh, this is also the area where these NF1 trials have been developed in the first place, that clinicians had a case and were thinking about how can we resolve first what the disease actually is, and then also which treatment might help that patient. So coming back here to these challenges uh, for NF1 trials are carryover effects that at least have to be considered or that might make these NF1 trials very challenging. And of course, the extreme case where NF1 trials might not be sensible is if you have a cure. So if one treatment can be a cure, then well, the carryover effect would be that no matter what you do afterwards, uh, you will not see any effect because the first treatment you took did the, did the job. Also, what uh, makes uh, the analysis of NF1 trials more challenging is if you have time invariant uh, treatments and outcomes, time varying. So if your treatments and outcomes might vary over time, then that might pose additional challenges for the analysis of the data that you gather. Jumping on. So what are, when you're planning an NF1 trial design considerations? I would say similar questions that you would uh, have to think about in any, any trial, any cohort study as well. What's the intervention that you want to compare? What are the intervention blocks? So how many times do you want to apply the intervention and in which design? Should it be A, B, B, A, A, B, A, B, or A, 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 B, 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 B? So these kinds of questions, how long and uh, in which variation? Then you have to think about the run-in time, wash-in time, wash-out time, blinding. That's an interesting concept when you think about these NF1 trials for a single patient. Um, and that is definitely, that might be different, I would say, from conversional, conventional RCTs. Also, if we're talking about performing these NF1 trials, actually with single patients, maybe through an app, then another big question is, how do you combine this usability versus what we want as researchers, maybe also as clinicians, gathering as much information, as much data as we can, including maybe personalized information. And among that might be if you're performing a trial just in one person, since you're doing the analysis within the person, you don't really have to care about the, the age of the person, that if, as researchers, you want to aggregate the data you might be very much interested in. 
So then the question might be, uh, you don't have to ask the single pe person for its age or for further personal information, but you might be really, if as a researcher, you want to aggregate the data afterwards. And finally, then if you want to present the results of the trial to the patient, to the participant, then how do you visualize that? Which might be a little bit different than what we think about in our publications, how we transform and how we transport our message to the individuals. So with all of these, um, I think this is a, actually a very exciting field because it's much more complex. Um, and while maybe as epidemiologists, we have clear cut guidelines that we should follow it for preventing bias, for preventing bias due to selection, due to blinding, due to randomization and all of that. And here on the one hand, some of the principles might not be necessary, but then also I think oftentimes it's a lot less clear what the benefit is. So if you have to weigh between um, conducting the study as long as you should so that you achieve your uh, the desired power compared to making it shorter, but then uh, having a high probability that the participant actually finishes the trial, or these practical considerations, I think this is uh, what I've come to um, really study a, a very interesting topic and then also studying this in a more principled way. What would be best design considerations if you're trying to weigh the advantages of being principled or as being a bit more prone to bias, but then having a higher chance, for example, of gathering enough data. There are principles and protocols though. So there are the spent guidelines. Um, so just like for any other study design, this has been recently published last year in BMJ, um, there are guidelines how to pro derive protocols and then also how to construct, conduct studies for N of one trials that can be used for orientation and for planning. All right, coming back to the study design of N of one trials. So we have these multiple crossover control trials that uh, I want to pick up the point again, how do we best and optimally randomize or select the number of treatments and the order of those treatments? Which is if we're comparing two treatments, A and B, two interventions, AB, if we just apply each of them once, EA, ABBA, maybe should we include some intermediate, some baseline period, and then some intermediate uh, phases where we don't apply a treatment? And what about, or how long should we apply those? So there is definitely some research we can use. Um, and here I'm citing one paper here from the 90s from trial designs in general that I have looked at which study designs are optimal for a given study. And um, for example, in here, considering one specific example where you're comparing two treatments and four blocks, then you can say you can derive the optimal treatment that is, depending on your effect sizes, either sequential or alternating AB blocks. So then either AB, 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 or ABBA, ABBA in that instance. So for a given situation with a given length, you can derive optimal treatments. And there's also recent work on adaptive designs. So that one here on adaptive Bayesian designs, if you're thinking of informing the optimal design and by including previous knowledge you've gathered maybe from the first treatment block, how you then should adapt the further treatment sequence. Stefan, can I interrupt with a question? Go ahead. Um, so the question is, so, so people are noticing, of course, that it resembles the crossover design, but with one individual. And so some, some questions about the benefit over the crossover design, you're probably integrating that um, into the next, the next couple of slides, but just that that question is kind of out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks. So I, I can pick that up and I would say benefits and also challenges. So these are two points we have to consider here. So the obvious benefit I would say is that here you can make inference on the individual. Whereas in, in population level crossover trials, you might not be interested in that. So you might use crossover designs, population level designs in choosing just another design for deriving average treatment effects. 
and that's fine. But then if you're focusing on the individual and in addition to that, you're interested in actually finding out what helps each participant, that's then an advantage I would see in NF1 trials. With the challenges that come along, I would say, and the challenges are, for example, deriving the optimal treatment design. In that sense, while we can derive the optimal way on the population level then, that might still not tell me what's the best design for a given individual. And so here, this is from another uh, recent paper, an example um, from a simulation study where they compared different designs here, just one, two, one, two, so A, B, A, B, or A, B, B, A, or then B, A, A, B. So varying these treatment designs. What is depicted here are different simulation runs where the true effect size, so the difference between the effects of the two treatments is 10. And then some standard uh, linear mix model is used for the analysis. And then each of those points here would be one individual N of one trial. And uh, from this individual N of one trial, the difference in effects between that. So what you can see here now, and then the red dot, which is not so important for us, is the median of the significant ones here. So the red dots are those individual trials where there was a significant uh, individual uh, effect estimate found. And what you can see here, and I think the main point why I wanted to show this is depending on how carryover effects work and which treatment you start off first, there is a large difference here just between ABBA and BAAB. So while you might say if, while you might say that on average on the population level, no matter if you choose ABBA or BAAB, you will have an unbiased estimate of the population level treatment effect. For a single participant, these might be very different. So this is one other aspect that I definitely would say is more challenging in NF1 trials compared to crossover population level trials that you have to consider. That is then much more interesting to think about from a modeling point of view. So then how can we still try to attack this and target this and maybe using adaptive methods, try to figure out an optimal treatment suggestion. If you go one step further, um, so if we have NF1 trials um, and compare them to RCTs, there have been actually very few studies. So I think this is one area uh, where there's a lot of chance to dive deeper and to get more insights on how do these different study designs actually compare. So picking up the question from the chat. So they have, there has been one study that was published uh, where in simulation studies, they compared the power and then the needed sample size of N of one trials compared to conventional parallel RCTs or crossover RCTs. And what at least to me is not surprising that was confirmed in the simulation studies, if you just compare the number of participants and you perform conventional trials where each participant is in one arm, or you take one participant that provides data longitudinal over time, that if those individuals provide more data points, you can increase your power. And you might need fewer, generally you need fewer participants if they provide you with more data points over time. Which then can be an argument for saying that NF1 trials have the chance at least to require a lot fewer participants in trials compared to crossover RCTs, for example. However, obviously, I think a very important point that has to be considered is the potential dropout rate. So that uh, that is not the case if you're measuring just per a person once, I would say the dropout rate or the missing data um, probability is much lower compared to if you require one participant to participate daily uh, over 16 weeks. Exactly. And Stefan, in general, another question from the chat, the duration of the study would be longer due to those different phases and, and cycles than a typical RCT, let's say. Yes, yes. So I would say if an RCT, definitely. So if an RCT only has to consider one treatment maybe and the effect of one treatment, then in an end of one trial, you might then consider after that block, 
and the treatment, the carryover effect has run out, maybe then apply the second treatment. And since you're doing the analyses within individuals, you need to really to think about your statistical power so that you can actually gather meaningful information of one individual. And just gathering four data points, applying the treatment once, ABBA, and just gathering four data points, I would say uh, would not be recommended for your statistical analysis of doing a t-test of two versus two. So that's definitely one challenge and one thing to consider that in order to get your individualized treatment effects, you do need a large enough sample size, which here comes out to having a long enough study and gathering enough data points within individuals as well. If you do those N of 1 trials, um, you can also combine them with conventional RCTs. So that's one area that has been recently um, explored. And also, obviously, as you can imagine, if there is more data available, so if there are published N of 1 trials in addition to conventional RCTs, then that can be another good argument for combining the two in a meta-analysis and might help you again for improving the power and precision. So that's one more thing maybe to consider um, if we're doing systematic reviews or meta-analyses on any randomized trials to also look out for N of 1 trials and maybe including them into the review. which might be, of course, of interest really in situations where there's little evidence from the traditional RCTs and maybe some groups have been left out. I see that there's one more q and A. I'm not sure if that's for that slide, so I'm going to wait for a second. Yeah, I was, I was going to wait with that one a little bit longer to see great. if it's maybe covered, great. but we'll come back to it otherwise. It's a good one for the discussion. Okay, great. So, Let's talk about are these new? They're not. Um, and that comes back also to the systematically trying out. So you can argue that clinicians have been doing N of 1 trials intuitively forever, in that sense. So then for the first time when it has been mentioned, the systematic trying out was in a paper in the 50s here, where that was for a single patient. The disease was unclear. Uh, so it was for a thyroid uh, disorder patient that showed some ongoing weakness of muscles. So then the question is, what would be the best treatment? And actually, what's the underlying disease? Is it really thyroid uh, disorder or is it maybe myopathy? So then in that instance, in that paper, they described such a systematic design of saying, let's try out different treatments, see which of them works. And then also by investigating which treatment works better, maybe conclude back on what the underlying disease might be, which was uh, one of the first studies that described such a systematic trying out of different regimes. Then for a long time, I would say there was not so much in the literature of this systematic trying things out and reporting them in the literature. And then in, in the 80s, uh, this was where the term of N of 1 randomized controlled trials was coined by Goyard et al. Where again, for a single patient, um, in that instance here, an asthmatic patient, again, the question was, what's the best treatment regimes? Are these better agonists or some other treatment form? And they used an N of 1 trial and coined the term also for figuring out which of the treatment works better for that patient. Now, after that, um, then the first guidelines were derived and N of 1 services were set up at McMaster University in Hamilton in Canada, but then set up such services at a university hospital really aimed towards single patients where physicians could come with case reports and trying to figure out in such a systematic way what's working better for that patient here. That was then continued also at other institutions and universities, mainly in Canada, the US, and then also in Australia. And I would say since then, there have been some trials and some studies, but only within the last five to 10 years, I would say there has been now, the topic has been picked up more and there has also been now more methodological work and a renewed interest in these N of 1 trials which I found also illustrated here in, a, in this graph where I did a PubMed search for publications on NF1 trials. So that's just looking at 
whether n of one trials appears in the title and abstract. So obviously that are also encompasses opinion pieces, but then in addition to protocol papers, but just to show that the interest really that's all papers that are on PubMed and even if that's not 10, but only five of them are actual protocols. So that's not a lot of studies. You do see an increase uh, since 2016 in the number of studies. And what I always find interesting when you look at those uh, figures here, so we saw that in 2018, there were 48, then 56. Maybe that's a question for everyone. If you see those figures, what do you think uh, last year, 2020? How many studies have been published on, how many N of 1 trials have been published last year when we see that exponential? Now I cannot see the Q&A, but maybe if anyone from the Q&A or from the panel here wants to venture a guess. Well, I so I can say that um, before, much before last year, I had never heard of it, to be honest. Yeah. And within the last year, the amount I've heard about it is probably, yeah, four, five, six times. So I would say, I would say 400. All right. Okay. Yeah, that might fit very well. Now we've, we've learned a lot about exponential growth uh, over the last year. Um, but that oh, was not the case. Really? Actually. Okay. My knowledge is just delayed or my, my information is delayed. Which, uh, thank you, Jess, for that was exactly the mindset that I had when I did the search. So I did it a year ago and then again yesterday in trying to figure out and I was expecting, like you said, hey, that looks like a nice exponential curve. It has not been that way, which I think is interesting. And of course, now we can try to figure out if everybody was occupied with COVID and N of one trials for COVID are not the best thing to do or uh, whether it's just plateaued at that interest. So that might to be seen here. But in that instance, at least here, what I find interesting, so it has been ongoing and it's not something new, this principal way of trying out, but it is not mainstream research uh, and it has not been integrated into mainstream research, I would say. All right. So how many trials, uh, that's another PubMed search I did where I look now a bit more closely, just comparing the number of N of 1 trials and RCTs. And while still this is a very imprecise and uneducated guess just by searching how often, how many papers do I find for these different disease areas where in our N of 1 trial and RCT is mentioned in the abstract or title, the numbers are not comparable. And I looked in a bit more detail how many of those were actual studies, and there are very few. So if you're interested in migraine, for example, you can do a systematic review quite quick um, because there are only two N of one trials that I found published on that topic. All right. So why haven't why hasn't then there been more interest in these N of one trials? Why haven't they been taken over the research? when you can get individual level treatment effects in addition to this population level effects. I think a lot has to do with the challenges that come around with them, that uh, we are in fact often interested in population level effects, that the first thing we can think about and then trying to deduce from the population level effects and uh, the challenges uh, that come along with them, carry over effects, wash in, wash out. What I do see as also another main argument is that there is no platform yet available for actually conducting these N of 1 trials easily. And then also there is a lot of work to be done on the statistical methods for analyzing that data, which was a big motivation for us. What I'm gonna present uh, in the next slides here of developing a platform for conducting these N of 1 trials. Stefan, maybe before you go into that, just to address the one question now that we've we've had the intro, mm -hmm. a general question about this N of one name potentially being a misnomer mm -hmm. in the sense that you you probably wouldn't publish an N of one trial of one person, but a study where you did a lot of these N of one trials with many persons. Mm -hmm. So is it not really then N of greater than one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I do see that. I I, I would imagine that you might publish actually uh, uh, studies of N of 1 trials, but not in epi journals, um, I would say. So case reports or really individual N of 1 trials might be of high interest to clinicians, I would say. Um, th on the other hand, 
so I guess um, whether that's the best name for it or whether series of N of one trials is a good name for it, I I'm happy. Um, so I do think the series of N of one trials, to me at least, is a good rep representation of what it does. But I agree that if we're taking a population level perspective, then we're we're always interested in performing more these N of one trials on more than one person. Yes. Okay, we'll keep the rest maybe for the end discussion. Good. Yeah. And then before I'm going to start with a study you suggest so a very quick um, overview of what is out there. So we started thinking about if we want to do these N of one trials digitally through a platform, is there any tool available, available that allows you to do that? And obviously there are many apps and many platforms available that allow you to track yourself, that allow you to implement studies, that allow you also to gather data from these studies. And here I've listed uh, the main um, apps that I found for, for N of one trials. However, all of them have some limitations um, in that sense. So there are some which don't allow you to actually what, are, what is of interest to NF1 trials, analyze the data within the app and provide the results back to the participant. So that's one big limitation of some available tools, like for example, the MovieSense um, package here. And then there are some of these apps which are geared to say one specific disease. So if you're interested in actually studying effect of that intervention and that intervention for Parkinson's disease, then you might want to use that tool. However, for us as researchers or clinicians, if we're asking, I have this disease of interest that I want to study, then they might not be, be applicable. So all of them have some limitations if we want to design a new study and implement that, which means that as of now, right now, um, when we started the work on that, you actually needed a developer and develop your own app for actually doing a study. So that was our motivation of developing a platform that we called StudyU which was from a master's project with uh, six great master's students um, in the summer semester at the HPI that I now want to present in a bit more detail. So here, what we wanted to do is we want to build a platform that allows you to investigate the effectiveness of health interventions on an individual level. A platform where you can design and conduct those NF1 trials, so both of these things so that both researchers and clinicians can benefit from it in conducting the studies actually, but then also the participants in getting to know the results and what helps them. So we spend a lot of time then thinking about how can we design the platform how uh, from a user perspective and what are the elements that are needed to be in there. So what the platform or how it is conceptualized is that we have the study you app, the platform where researchers can design the study. Study participants can participate in the study and get individual results on their progress on what they did with uh, the study. And then also the researchers and clinicians can back aggregated data for any population level results. And also the platform can be used not only by one researcher but making it open source and publicly available, our aim was really a building a platform where then multiple, multiple apps are implemented, multiple studies, so that many people can, part, can design studies and participate in different studies. So what uh, StudyU allows is to flexibly design fully digital studies where, so that you or we now as researchers don't need software developers. Um, study participants can be engaged fully digitally, um, only have to download the app in, in order to actually do the study, and then can get personal results from one and from multiple studies. There's a study designer, a specific application for designing the study, then the study app and a dashboard where the results can be viewed. Um, it's available on multiple platforms. And we had to think a lot about user accounts and of course, anonymization of data pseudonymization. So the platform right now does not take any user accounts so that uh, to ensure the anonymity of the participant data, well, there is an in-app electronic consent. 
and then some more uh, user progress to actually try and keep the participants in the app. So taking a quick tour of how the study designer and then the study app look like and what the elements are. So this is an overview of current studies that we've implemented. None of them are running yet, though if you go to the website, uh, you could participate and actually do that. But they've been mostly used for trying out and for implementing different studies and seeing whether all the elements are there. So here you would have a dashboard with different studies that are in draft mode that right now Jess could go to and uh, add on and edit the menstrual pain uh, in a font trial. In each study, you have all the different elements that we talked about before that you have to specify, such as what's the intervention you want to study, who do you want to include, what's the outcome you're interested in, and then how often times is what measured, plus then the consent form that after you filled out all those details, you can publish the study. And after the studies are published through that designer, you can then participate in the studies here in the study you app. So in the study you app that the participants would download to participate in. First of all, here there are terms of use. So that's one way of ensuring um, the consent of the participants in using the app at first. So that's one important part that we thought about. And then after selecting a study, which are those that are available that have been implemented by the researchers in the study designer, then their participants have to give additional consent to the specific study. And these consent that might differ between studies and that has to be provided by the researcher. So in that sense, all the elements are there that you would also need to do in a uh, conventional in-person, I would say, study. And then after that, you get an overview as a participant about the study, who has designed it, some more information about the ethics board, can choose if the researcher allows you to which intervention you want to compare, and then get each day according to the journey you chose of comparing the different treatments you're asked each day of whatever your study asks you. So in that sense, if it's a study for IBS, then here the study was designed to daily ask about gastrointestinal complaints and then some more question assessing how you felt on each day where you took where you followed one or the other diet. So that's uh, implemented and available in study you um, where there's a lot of ongoing work also where we're editing and uh, adding more details to the platform. In addition to this, there's also one, I think, really fascinating element uh, where we're looking at in detail, which I think can be one of the points that I would like to discuss later about how to integrate those into larger cohort studies, for example. So what then, if you have these studies, allows you to do. So both, I would say, we can use such a platform for implementing studies and saying and inviting participants from big cohort studies to investigate some interventions embedded within big cohort studies. However, what we can also do is we can include study participants to design their own study. So in that sense, what are people interested in studying actually? Is everybody interested in studying now back pain and weight gain in times of Corona? And how can we actually help participants thereby also gathering data, interesting data if we in that sense, aggregate lots of data for population levels studies. So these are some of the areas we're looking into. What are people actually interested in? How should the platform be adapted also for study participants to design their own study so that not only epidemiologists, but everybody can design their own study that makes sense to evaluate in a systematic way? And then also, how can you be, uh, integrate both of these platforms into one? I think uh, we have about 10 minutes left, uh, maybe, Jess, if I'm looking at the time. Yeah, we, we started a couple minutes later. So if we keep it to like 8 to 10, that'd be great. Good. OK. So here, I briefly wanted to give, I think, yeah, 5 to 8 is good, 5 to 8 minutes, an idea about statistical methods without diving into details. 
because in a sense, many of the standard methods you would uh, learn in any intro to biostats can be applicable also to N of one trials. So what are we interested in? We're interested in estimating and testing both individual and then also aggregate effects of interventions on a health outcome. So what has been popularly applied in case reports was to some extent a qualitative description of the results, but then standard methods, t-tests, ANOVA, mixed models um, that now have been added a bit more to specific forms of aggregate t-tests or also patient regression models. There are also some machine learning tools that are potentially applicable to estimate individual level treatment effects from observational data. But then when we look at those, um, I think there is still a lot of potential for improvement, mainly when we're interested in going beyond mean treatment effects, I would say. So um, when the standard methods mostly focus on average treatment effects, what if you really use the full potential of these digital apps, you gather more information over time. So you have a complex causal graph over time, time series. You might incorporate sensor data. You might measure number of steps or heart rate from sensors. So you might end up with very complex uh, data that might not be applicable for using t-tests in that sense. So that's one limitation I would see in standard methods but then also in machine learning methods that are available, that are available for estimating given some assumption individual level treatment effects, but that are not really geared towards using the N of one trial design, where you actually have by design some features that you can uh, adjust for within person uh, effects because you're comparing treatments within one person. Another interesting and challenging um, point here though is that if you want to provide the results back to, to the participants all the methods you're implementing should be implementable on the phone so if we're talking about complex models if you want the data to be analyzed on the phone so that the results can be reported back to the participant you would need to think about that implementation that is also computationally feasible Maybe here, um, finishing up and giving some idea, some taste of how the what we're thinking about in terms of analysis. In a first study now, where we're planning to apply study U is for studying low back pain, where the two interventions we're studying is what's the difference in effects of providing physical back pain interventions, either through videos or through Zoom sessions. So if you're doing physical exercises, but the instructions are either provided by video snippets that you can watch or that you're actually participating in Zoom live sessions, is there a difference between the two? And then thinking about, uh, well, conducting N of one trials in evaluating that within persons, which is, I think, a great example where you have to think about carryover effects. Because if you're thinking about, well, I'm doing exercise today that then might affect my pain levels today. And then I'm doing again exercise tomorrow, which might affect my pain levels tomorrow. Obviously, if I'm doing if I'm doing exercise today, you're hoping to build up maybe muscles or flexibility over time that you are expecting also an effect on pain levels tomorrow. And then I'm sure that there are also some more complex effects of my pain levels today that might cause me to sleep better or worse on my pain levels tomorrow. So already within this very small causal graph, um, this is not straightforward to model. So we do have to think about modeling carryover effects, time-varying treatments maybe, and time-varying outcomes. And even more so when we expand that model here and try to um, estimate aggregate level effects. And as a second use case, what we're looking at also in the first phase is studying what are short-term and medium effects of drinking coffee on heart rate. So these are not invasive, but also already here, you can see this is an example where the outcome data is a time series from uh, here from sensors that might look like this, but you then have to think about more than average 
treatment effects within an individual. So what it allows you to think about what actually is a short-term and medium-term effect in terms of variability of blood pressure and heart rate, or what are really meaningful and interesting biological phenomena that you want to study. With that, let me skip over some more statistical approaches that might be applicable and end with a discussion and some thoughts that I hope to talk about how can we combine that. What I think is a really exciting area that I want to work on is thinking about how you can derive such optimal adaptive N of one trial designs where you might think about, well, incorporating knowledge from previous studies and how can you derive, how can you integrate those? How can you build such platforms? How can you analyze maybe data that was previously assessed from different trials using some network meta-analysis or transfer learning approaches? And then also think about uh, always how is that embedded in which kind of causal DAC that you should incorporate if you want to predict the outcome for a single patient and thereby deriving the optimal treatment strategy for that given patient and for that trial. So these are some questions um, that I'm curious to hear your opinions. So can we, would it be interesting to include digital N of one trials and cohort studies for how might that look like that we push some intermediate short-term intervention plus then observe maybe longer term um, disease outcomes. We are planning that's more on the short term um, integrating study U in a study at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York into a cohort study there where we have a clearer focus on assessing sensor data and studying their cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes. Plus then what you have, what you can have with these digital one digital N of one trial apps is I think the potential to really bring also the medical research and personal health closer together. Maybe I'll stop here. Um, I don't want to um, forget of thanking all the students and all the people that were involved here in the work, uh, Christoph Lippert and Erwin Wettinger at the HBI. And then these are all the great students that are working on the project. Plus, finally, uh, before we go into the discussions, if any of that is interesting for any one of you, I'm happy to talk about collaborations. Um, and I also will be hiring um, some students. Thanks. Great. Stefan, thank you so much. On behalf of everybody watching, a big round of applause. I would like to now um, stop the recording so we can open, turn it over to the Q&A.